Okay, um, well, first of all, thanks for uh, having me back again. I uh, really appreciate it, I do. I, you know, I had a great monologue worked up before I got into the, the word tonight. Um, you know why most uh, late night talk show hosts do a monologue? It's not so they can come out and tell their, their jokes, which are sometimes funny, but it's to get the butterflies out of their stomach and get the cobwebs out of their knees so that they can get into the flow of the evening. But I will tell you, you know, the word that the Lord put on my heart tonight, I was really struggling with because it's a challenging word. But each one of the exhortations we had tonight fed into it. And so as they were speaking, as Michael, as Julia, as, as thank you, Kelly, were sharing, it, you know, it, God was just saying, you know what, there you go, you got your confirmation. So I'm going to skip my, my monologue tonight, and we're going to get right into it, because this is, uh, I think you're going to be, well, you're going to be challenged tonight. You're going to, you know, you're going to hear some things that make you, may make you cringe in your seat and get you to thinking, and if that's the case, that's awesome. That's the intent of this, because we do need to think about what Michael said, what Julia said. We have to embrace the Lord. We have to be ready to, and even Brother Tony, what he said, you know what? We, we have breakthrough at our, at our disposal. We just have to grab it. So anyway, the name of my message tonight, you can put the title up there, is Jesus Christ, are you a fan or a follower? And there is a very distinct difference. So, let's get into it, shall we? You know, we live in an area in the northeast of, um, of the United States, and we're blessed to have many choices as to the teams that we follow. Now, I'm going to take this fan perspective from that of a sports vernacular because, you know, I'm a guy. We like sports. And uh, listen, I know a lot of you ladies do, too. And I know a lot of you ladies can talk football and basketball just as good, or in some cases, even better than their husbands do. I mean, my wife can talk ACC basketball with the best of them. But anyway, you know, we're, we live in an area that we're blessed to be able to choose a number of teams to, to root for, to be fans of. In this church alone, we have Red Sox fans. We have Yankees fans. <laughs> We have Giants fans. Oh, I'm sorry, that must have been after one of their losses. <laughs> we even have fans from that school in stores, I think. Do they still have a football or basketball team? We have crazy fans. And fans are crazy. And, of course, crazies with the Cameron crazies from Duke. And, of course, the best of all, I say for last. <laughs> Now, fans do crazy things. We wear crazy masks. We wave our terrible towel. You notice the color here. We even have a Santa Claus fan. But anyway, you know, I bet if I were to draw or take a statistical sample and come out with what's called a bell curve. And you're familiar with what a bell curve is. It looks like that. I bet you 95% of the people that come to our church that are in here tonight fit the mode of one of those levels of fans. Red Sox, Yankees. I'm sorry, guys. I forgot to put Patriots up there. So, so you can jump on me later. So anyway... I bet you 95% of you fall within that curve. And then there's the 5% of us that are in the outliers, what we call the tails of the bell curve, that don't really care for those teams. As hard as it is to believe, we really don't. You know, we're the outliers. We're the oddities. You know, we go for, like Tommy and Mike, although I have no earthly idea why, they go for Duke. I know Pastor Pete goes for Duke, too. So, Pastor, if you're watching, you're okay. But, um, you know, me, I'm a Tar Heel. I went to Carolina. I grew up in Carolina. So I bleed Tar Heel blue. And I'm going to tell you a little joke. So look, and please, this is just a joke. We know that God is a fan of football or basketball. And we know that God likes Carolina. You know why? 
Because in Carolina, we have a saying, if God is not a Tar Heel, why is the sky Carolina blue? So the next time you're driving down the road and you see a beautiful blue sky, yeah, Randy was right. Okay. Anyway, you know, many of us that weren't born in this area, you know, we didn't develop an affinity for those teams. You know, in baseball, I'm a Braves fan. I'm a Panthers fan for football and, of course, in Carolina. Maybe we just grew up in another area of the country or, you know, we... We attached ourselves to teams that our relatives liked, or maybe it was the first game that we saw on television, or even when we used to read that thing called the newspaper to get our sports highlights. You know, regardless, we have our teams that we support, and they're different from the 95% of you that fall under that statistical bell curve. But here, at the end of the day, it's all in fun, right? We talk trash to each other. Tommy and Mike and I, we go back all the time with each other. We jive with each other. We poke fun when their team loses and our team wins and vice versa. But when it's all over, we put it into the proper context and realize that we're all just, they're all just games. And there are more important things to worry about. Work, cars, finances, children, etc. And as long as we keep the fanaticism of the games in the proper context, we're okay. We're fans, we love our teams, we're diehard supporters, but they have their proper place. So you're gonna be asking yourself, where is he going with this? Before we get into the thrust of my argument tonight, I want to dig just a little bit deeper into this fan concept. I want to explore and set the foundation for the difference between a fan and someone who is a little more committed to their cause, who is a little more invested in who and what and why they support their favorite team or their favorite belief. And we don't have to stick with the sports. It could be politics, although a lot of people like to avoid that, and I understand that. But it could be movies. I know we have a lot of Star Wars people here and a lot of um, Jason Bourne people here, and that's cool. I'm a Jason Bourne guy. But um, anyway, the type of person that uh, you know I'm, I'm looking for and I'm going to describe here in the next minute or so, is what I would call the fair weather fan. You know, this is the guy that's all on board when his team is doing well. He's the rah, rah, re, re, let's go when his team is winning. When all is well with his team, when the weather is really good. But as soon as things go bad, watch out. A loss here and there, a tough, you know, a string of losses, a losing record, losing to the team you despise, it gets tough sometimes, and sometimes the emotions come out, and it is impossible to be in the same room with them when the game is on TV. Guys and ladies, you do know, of course, that when you yell at the TV, they can't hear you, right? <laughs> Listen, I understand. I really, really do understand this. And I've done my share at yelling at the TV, and I still do, because the way I see it, you know, when I'm yelling at the referee who is right down on the field or right down on the court, merely feet away from the action, when they get the call wrong, they need to know about it. <laughs> okay, listen, I know how it feels. It doesn't feel good. It hurts because it hurts our team, and we want our team to do well. Trust me, an occasional outburst is okay. It really is. It's cathartic. It helps to eliminate our stress, though it may increase the stress of those that are around us. But it is when we begin to actually turn on our teams, to chastise them, to berate them, to stop supporting them, to actually boo for them, that we reach the level of a fair weather fan. I was watching the, the um, Cincinnati Bengals and Houston Texans last week, and the Bengals were undefeated at the time, and they were just having a horrible game. They couldn't gain a yard to save their life. And by the end of the third quarter, their fans were actually booing them. Now, to anybody that's ever played sports and has been on the field when the stands are booing, you know, we like to say we don't hear that, but we do, and they do, and it hurts. So, that being said, you know, when we get to that level, you know, we take our eye off our team, and we turn to something else, anything, at least until they start playing better. Then we're back on our bandwagon doing our rah-rahs and our yahoos, and the cycle repeats itself. So we find ourselves not following or supporting our favorite team at times, and when we're with them, that's great, but when we drop them like a hot potato when they stink. It's a good thing that we're all fans of Christ, right? I mean, hey, we're saved. We're guaranteed eternal life. 
salvation because of our prayer. And he is um, with us in good times and in bad. I mean, we do stick with him, don't we? We don't drop him when things are going well or when they're not going so well. You know, let's think about this. You know, the job's going great. The money's coming in. Kids are behaving themselves. Life is good. We're staying with him. We're talking to him. We're praying to him. We're communing with him, right? Or do we only call and acknowledge him when things go bad? Let's look at it this way. You know, we have a relationship with the Lord, and that is a really good thing, especially when things are going well. But they don't always go well, do they? Sometimes bad things do happen. A loss of a job. I can speak to that personally. An accident, a lawsuit, a failed semester in college, the death of a friend or family member. And we find, in our, we find ourselves asking, how could God let this happen? And in our grief, when we need him most, sometimes we turn from him simply because we can't believe that he would allow us to go through this pain. And we drop him. We stop praying. We stop communing. Are we any different from fans when that happens? We stick with God when things are good, but we drop him when things aren't so good. When we're faced with the challenges that come in life, when we're faced with doing the things that we have to do or should do, but we certainly don't want to do. Let's take a look at an inverse situation, do a 180 degree flip. Let's just say that we've come from the pits of despair, from addiction, from overcoming hurts, habits, and hangups, and we're filled with gratitude now because God has brought us through that. We're getting our life back in order. Things are good. We're on our way. So good, in fact, that we find ourselves becoming less and less dependent on God and more on ourselves. We don't need God now, so we turn our backs on him and tell him to back off. Are we any different than a fan here? Did we jump off the fanatical bandwagon to go on our own and find something else? The pendulum does swing both ways. Here's an interesting tidbit. Jesus had fans. He really did. He had all sorts of people following him. He had the multitudes of people, the 5,000 people that came to hear him preach. But guess what? They're really getting into what he's saying, but then noontime comes and they realize they haven't eaten lunch and they start getting hungry. They start getting unruly. But never fear, Christ is here. So what does he do? He feeds them. 5,000 men plus the women plus the children. And he fed them from five loaves and two fishes. He worked a miracle. So the multitudes, hey, they really like this. They reason not only do we get a show with this guy, but he feeds us too. What a deal. There were others that followed Jesus too. A little more curious about him. We call these the miracle seekers. Some of these folks followed him for the chance to get a touch from him, to get some healing, and many did. We've talked about some of them lately right here in this church, from the woman with the issue of blood to the blind man at the pools of Bethesda. A lot of people followed Christ for a chance at healing, and a lot of them got healing, but a lot of them didn't, and they walked away disappointed and bitter, and they stopped following him. You know, I guess we see a modern-day version of this whenever we find out that, hey, there's a prophet in the house. Man, is this place filled when a prophet's in the house. You have to get here at 6 o'clock to get a seat. And if you don't get here by 6.30, 6.45, you're standing in the back. And, but why is this? Why do people crowd in? Because they come in and everybody crams in with the hopeful expectation of receiving a word from God through the prophet. And many do. But more don't than do. And some do go away disappointed or frustrated or bitter or envious or jealous. Hey, it's a normal human reaction, but that's what it is. It's a human reaction. It's an emotion based on will, based on desire. And I would ask, you know, where is the heart in there? Why can't we just bless and, and pray and be grateful for the person that did get a, a word? We don't know their circumstances. So we need to be grateful and respectful of that. So anyway, Christ had those that followed him, and he still has those that claim to follow him today. But I would wonder, are they really followers or are they merely fans? You know, I don't ever want to be called a fan of Christ. Fans are temporal, and they are only as good as the season that they're in. Fans come and go. Even the diehard fans have their moments, their seasons, when they are less than enthusiastic or engaged with their team. A fan, by Webster's definition, is an enthusiastic admirer. 
No, I don't want to be considered a fan when it comes to Christ. I want to be a follower, and I hope you do too. But what does it take to be a follower, and how do I know, how do you know if you are one? There is a big difference, a very big difference, and I hope you're prepared for the answer tonight. Excuse me. You see this wrist strap on my arm? I carry it with me. I wear it every day. It says, not a fan. Now, some of you may be familiar with the not a fan um, book that came out about a year or so ago. It's a Bible study. There's actually a teaching series on it. It's a very good program. We don't have it here, but I'm hoping that at some point in time, somebody will step up and, and lead it. But I will tell you, this little black wristband has opened more doors of opportunity to witness the word of God than any evangelical tract or tool I have ever been given. People see this wristband and natural curiosity. I mean, we all do it. We see wristband. We look and see, what does your wristband say? It's human curiosity. It doesn't matter if I'm at the car wash with my hand hanging out the window or at a coffee shop with my hand reaching for my cup of coffee. Hey, what are you not a fan of? I say, and I ask them, do you really want to know? And of course they say, yeah. And I say, well, I'm not a fan of Jesus. Now, depending on what their theology is, you either get, all right, or really? You're not a fan of Jesus? How can that be? I just say, I'm not a fan. And they look dumbfounded. They look Huh? They're scratching their heads trying to figure out what's going on. But I quickly say, no, I am not a fan of Jesus, but I'm trying to be a follower. And trying is the key word. You know, once I say I'm a follower, they come back. What's the difference? And that is the door of opportunity that I can open to go in and share the gospel. That is where I can go in and share a little bit of my story about what Jesus has done for me, to share a little bit about what he's done for so many others that I know. From an evangelical perspective, this little wrist strap is a powerful tool. But we're going to have to save the talk about evangelism and this tool for another day. I just wanted to whet your appetite for that. Because what I really want to spend the rest of our time on tonight is what does it take and what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What does it look like and how does it differ from being that of an enthusiastic admirer of Christ? At some point in time, most of us in this room have all been faced with a choice, a decision that we have to make. Regardless of what it is, we've had to make a decision about something in our life. I'm not talking about the decisions, though, that we have to make in our day-to-day -day activities, like what am I going to wear to work today, you know, what shirt am I going to wear, what, you know, what am I going to put in my coffee, whatever. No, I'm talking about the really big, life-changing decisions that we've had to make, like what college or job do I go to when I graduate from high school or college? Should I enlist, should I enlist in the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, or the Marines? Should I say yes if he asks me? Should I take that drink or that toke? Do I tell the truth, or do I try to lie my way out of this one? Should I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? You know, all of these types of choices are life-changing, but only one of them is truly life-saving. I imagine at some point, most of us here tonight were brought to a point where somebody simply asked us if we wanted to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And based on the fact that you're sitting here tonight, sitting in your seats, having the pleasure of listening to me right now, in the case that you said yes. Well, I hope you're still glad when we're done tonight. So we have a relationship with Christ. That is great. But let's go a little deeper. Let's spend some time and do something that, well, quite honestly, guys don't like to do. Women like to do it, but not guys. Let's spend some time examining our relationship. In this particular situation, though, it's our relationship with Christ. Let's have what's called a DTR moment. Anybody know what DTR stands for? Ladies, you should know this. Define the relationship. Usually it happens after you've been going steady for a while or you've been married for a while. Honey, let's define our relationship. Let's talk about our relationship. At that point in time, 
the dog's going to need to be walked, the car's going to need to be washed, the snow, the shovel, the driveways will need to be shoveled. A guy will do anything to get out of that conversation. But the bottom line is, is that I do believe that most of us, including myself, do need to have a DTR talk with Jesus. We need to define our relationship with him and find out where we stand with him. Are we a fan of his or are we a follower? You know, Jesus actually invites us into this relationship with him, and he clearly lays out what it means to be a follower of him, where he states in Luke 9, 23, if you could put that up, please. Then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Three things, right? Three simple little things. That's all we have to do to be considered a follower of Jesus. Hmm. So you think... At this point, some of you might be thinking, hey, I'm saved, so that must make me a follower of Christ. Actually, it doesn't. Salvation is a free gift of God. We are saved by his grace. To be a committed follower of Christ comes with a cost. It comes with a price. There is a difference, and we're going to spend the next 30 minutes, 20 minutes, exploring this difference with the goal of helping you understand that if you are a follower of Christ or even if you want to be a follower of Christ, for it's not the easiest thing to do, please don't be discouraged by this. If you're, if you're a believing Christian here tonight, if you're invited Christ into your heart and you've asked him to be your Lord and Savior, you are saved. You have salvation. But you are here about to learn tonight that there is much more to it than just that. So let's go. A couple of key points about the term follower. Most people use the words follower and disciple interchangeably. And they are similar in some regards, but they are distinctively different. The word follower is from the Greek word akolotheo, which means to be in the same way with, to accompany, to follow, to follow one who proceeds, to join him as his attendant, to accompany him. The word follower is used over 60 times in the Gospels alone in reference to following Jesus. Compare this to the word disciple. The Greek root word means mathathes, which means learner or pupil. Note the difference. The broadest meaning of the word disciple in relation to Jesus Christ comes from those instances when the term is used in the context of the multitudes that followed him, those that we've already talked about. The crowds that followed Jesus could have been called disciples. But many of those, like we said, appeared to be more interested in the miracles that he performed than in Jesus himself and what he was or for the free food that he provided Smaller groups followed him as well and were also called disciples. Then there are those that seem to be more interested in what he was doing with a growing belief that he was indeed the Messiah. These people were a little more committed to Christ. They were his disciples, who we call the Twelve. The majority of the 60 references to the term followers in the Gospels commonly refers to Jesus as, their, as his disciples. They were committed to following Jesus in the same manner that others followed Moses, others followed the Pharisees, and this, those that followed John the Baptist. This commitment of individuals involved a deeper relationship with Christ. As Jesus began to teach the significance of his work on the cross to his disciples, he also expanded other stringent conditions for those who would continue to be his true disciples. These conditions, which are found in the following scriptures. Could you put the uh, multiple scripture chart up, please? Matthew 16, 24, 27. Mark 8, 34, 38. And Luke 9, 23, 26. I put these years up here, 80, 50, 60, etc. Those were the years that these scriptures, these gospels were written. So they were all written in the same time frame, but the interesting thing, they were written in different parts of the Middle East, different parts of the country where... Uh, Biblical events took place. But what I've done is I've highlighted the commonality between those three scriptures. Multiple authors all came up with the same thing, attesting to the accounts of what Jesus said when he was with the disciples. So when we're going to look at that, we look at what Jesus, these are the requirements that Jesus laid out and what it meant to be his follower. One must deny himself. One must take up his cross daily. One must follow Christ one must lose his life. One must not be ashamed of Christ. One must hate his family and his own life. And one must forsake all. Whew. 
So our three little items have now become seven. That's quite a list, isn't it? Got just a little bit tougher because each one of these has unique qualities that we're going to spend a brief moments talking about. Let's talk about what it means to deny oneself first because that's the one that trips up everybody. If you can't get past this one, you can't get past the other ones. This is the gatekeeper. To deny oneself means being mindful of the things of God, not the things of man. One must surrender himself and his right to organize, to run, to manage his own life, his self-life, his self-will, and submit that to the will of God. And we're going to spend some time talking about self-will. Self-will is the greatest enemy of man, and it hinders God from having his will perfected in man. Being at home with self is being far away from God. It is the self-will that triggers anger in a man. And I'm just going to say in man in reference to humanity, to the human being. It is a self-will that makes one boast. It is a self-will that makes us hold on to unforgiveness, bitterness, envy, indulge in fornication and adultery, give and take bribes to lie, kill, and cheat. Every sin committed emanates from efforts to gratify self-win, I mean self-will. Self-will cannot and never will be pleasing to God. Yet, man cannot survive without God. We need God in every aspect of our life. Life outside of God is miserable and unlivable. Think back to your life before you came to Christ. Think back. Was it working? No, that's a rhetorical question. Don't worry. You know, I think back to my life before coming to Christ. I didn't know Christ, and a lot of you in here have heard my testimony. A lot of you in here may remember about five or six years ago, my wife and I stood up here on a Sunday morning and gave our joint testimonies, and a lot of our testimony has to do with what our life was before coming to Christ. I tried to do things my own way, but because of the brokenness and the things that happened to me as a kid that manifested in other things in my adult life, I was a broken man. I was living a double life. I was trying to do it my way, and it wasn't working. My life was miserable to the point of trying to kill myself, to put myself out of misery because I couldn't live with the way I was conducting my life. My life was miserable, and it was unlivable. Now, yours may not have been that deep, but I'm sure there are things that we have all struggled with that we can attest to that since coming to Christ have been rectified, have been taken, have been where the healing and the restoration is kicked in. So we need to really think about that at times, and we have a lot to be grateful for. Self-life, self-will brings misery, and in misery, we cry out to God, and we remind him of his word and his promises. Have you given your life to God? If you have, you have salvation. But are you still controlled by your self-will? If you have, you have not died to yourself. You have not crucified your life to your self-will. You may have given your life to God, but you have not given up your self-will to God. Self-will must die for Christ's will, Christ's life to exist. God is merciful. We heard this tonight from Kelly. God is merciful, faithful, but at the same time, he's a very righteous God. He's a righteous dude. He cannot contradict himself. What he has spoken in his word, he fulfills. For God to have his right of way in your life, he first of all has to help you overcome the impact of free and free you from your own self-will. He has to free you from the slavery of your He has to free you from yourself. There are lots of us in here tonight that are under the captivity of self-will without even knowing it. A lot of you think that your enemy is the wicked man or the wicked woman or the wicked circumstances around you, and these people may be used by Satan's agents to impact you. But self-will causes greater havoc in your life than those wicked people because Satan's agents only operate where there is darkness. Here's a little secret. Self-will is sin. Darkness must exist in you before Satan can even have his agents touch you or harm you. And sin, as we know, is darkness. Self-will is the sinner in you. It is what gives life and rise to other sins. I know most of you are familiar with Paul's cry of despair in Romans 7, 15, 20. Could you put that up, Solomon? Thank you. 
I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I, I do, what I hate to do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living within me. I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do. I do the evil I do not want to do. That I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it. It is the sin living within me that does it. You know, the problem here is with the flesh. The part of the believer in which there is nothing good. There is a desire to do what is good. We all have that. But the ability to perform that good is lacking. The self-will is, no, is stronger, and it is part of the struggle that goes on within us. A fight for control. You know, our willpower fails us repeatedly, and it seems like the more we try to get a hold of our self-will to get self-control, the more elusive it seems. Now, here's the great news. There is a way to break free from self-will. It is the only way to break free from self-will. It's by crucifixion. It's by bringing self-will, self-life to death. Only the power of the cross of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, can deal with the self-life in a person. Only the Holy Spirit can destroy the self-life in you. You cannot do this, no matter how hard you try, by yourself. It's a spiritual battle, not a natural one. We have a saying to celebrate recovery. We say, I can't, he can, and I'm going to let him. What that basically means is that I can't fight this by myself, but I know somebody who can. It's Jesus Christ. I know he can. And when we reach to the point where we step out of our denial and we realize that we're powerless over this, we surrender to him, we invite him in, and let him start doing only what he can do. We acknowledge that we are powerless with our struggle, and we need a higher power, in our case, Jesus Christ, to help us do what ourselves cannot do. Human nature, which is self-will, loves comfort. It loves pleasure, wealth, success, good health, all those nice things. Self-will cannot stand or withstand hardship, discipline, lack, failure, or discomfort or any sort. That's why it's so hard to train for a sporting event. It's grueling behavior. It's, it's, it's discipline that it takes to get up at 5.30 every morning and run and do your weights and all that, do your training. It's grueling. It's hard. It wears you out. But if you don't do it, you won't succeed. Worst of all, self-will is never satisfied. It always wants more, and it will continue to ask for more until it is destroyed or until it destroys you. God allows for these trials in our lives so that we can visit our self-will. We talked about somebody had an exhortation about the trials, that we have to withstand them. God allows sickness. He allows lack. Poverty, barrenness, failure, disgrace. He allows these things until we come to the end of ourselves. And as long as, but as long as we continue to go around the mountain, and I think Kelly mentioned the mountain, he will continue to allow these things until we finally cry out to him in helpless surrender. When we hit our rock bottom, when we have dug ourselves so deep that we have nowhere to go but up. And he's there for us. I love Isaiah 118. You know the verse. Come, let us argue this out. Regardless the depth of the stain of your sin, I can make you as white as wool. I can clean you and make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Amen. The picture I get from this verse is me. It was me. It was my life. Stuck in the mud pit or the quicksand or the muddy murk, whatever you want to call it. Dying. Struggling. Fighting with myself. And finally, getting to the point where I can't do this anymore. I need help. And all of a sudden, here comes Jesus Christ with his victorious, righteous right hand reaching out to me. Now, he reached out to me. He did not reach down into that pit and pull me up. I had to make an act of my own self-will. And in the defining moment of my self-will, I reached up and grabbed his hand, and he pulled me out. And he said, it's about time. And it was. And in reality, it was the right time. So we die to our self-life, and we give our life to Christ. 
It is only through dying to self-will that the flesh is subdued and that carnality is destroyed and that the power of sin in our lives is broken because anyone who has died has been free from sin. And it is only through dying to self that the flesh is overcome. The I in you, the selfishness, gives the right away to Jesus in you, the selflessness. In order to experience the power of his resurrection, you must die to self and live the life of Christ. There is no shortcut here. There is no magic app here. You can't pull your cell phone out and dial it up and get saved like that. It doesn't work. If there is no death, there cannot be any resurrection. Death precedes resurrection, and resurrections precede extension. When self-life dies, self-will dies, Christ can fully live in you. So here's a quick guide on how to die to oneself. You need to know much about the Holy Spirit. You need to know much about his ministry. You must welcome the Holy Spirit into your life. And these are all things we do when we invite Christ into our hearts. So we're halfway there. Ask the Holy Spirit to reside and preside over your life. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal self-life in you in all its manifestations, the spiritual vices. These vices are the real obstacles to your spiritual growth. Ask the Holy Spirit to eliminate each vice he reveals to you. Now, here's the thing. He may not do this all at once. He may deal with the heaviest thing that you're dealing with right now. But, you know, we're all like onions. You get past the first layer, you got a lot of layers to go. So note that these vices cannot be rooted out of you without your willingness and your cooperation. You may need some help to get through this. You may need some counseling. You may need some accountability. You may need Celebrate Recovery. Ask for grace to willingly cooperate with the Holy Spirit to endure these things because some of the things that you're going to fight through when you get to this point, they can be painful, which is why you need the aforementioned assistance. You surrender your strength and your weakness to the Holy Spirit. You surrender the leadership and the management of your life to the Holy Spirit. You walk by the Spirit. Obey every instruction he gives you, no matter how weird it sounds. I was walking down the factory floor of Pratt and Whitney one day right after coming to Christ, and he says, go tell that woman over there working on that assembly thing that I love her. And I said, huh? He said, go tell that woman over there that, that I love her. And I kept walking. I got 30, 40 feet down the aisle. And finally, it got so heavy on my heart to go tell that woman that he loved her. I turned around and I said, okay, I may make a fool of myself. He said, don't worry about it. So I go tell this woman. I found out that her name was Pearl, and I used to visit her you know, every now and then after that. She's probably about 60 years old. I don't know. But she's sitting there working, and I went up to her and said, ma'am, you don't know me from Adam, but I'm just walking down the aisleway here, and I believe that the Lord told me to come up and tell you that he loves you. And she burst out crying. She said, you know, I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that because my life has been falling apart. There's things going on in my life I can't deal with, and I needed to know that somebody loved me. So no matter how weird it sounds, do it. Get intimate more and more with the Lord by spending quality time daily with him. Self-control is the opposite of self-will. It's something that develops as we grow closer to God, as we take one step at a time, one day at a time. God will give us his own character, which includes self-control. As we continue to follow God's guidance, taking one step at a time, our self-control will gradually grow. It will get stronger. Our job is to stay connected to God. It is the Holy Spirit's job to produce the fruit of self-control in your life. Galatians, it's one, of the Holy, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And thank you, Celebrate Recovery, for those words of wisdom. Self-will is a tough, wild pony to tame, but it can be broken. So that's item number one, deny. The rest of them aren't that long. Next thing we have to do is take up our cross daily. What does that look like? Well, it means to make oneself as a condemned man, a willingness to suffer for Christ, saying yes to something for Jesus, no matter how weird it sounds. To take up one's cross is to consider oneself willing to go as Jesus did, even to a martyr's death. This includes the shame that might come with identifying oneself with Jesus Christ. It is the image of one willing to accept rejection, using the picture of the shame that came with carrying the cross to one's death. If you remember, crucifixion in, the, in those days 
was reserved for the worst people in society. I mean, to be crucified, you were considered the worst of the worst of the worst. You were scum. And it brought shame to the family members of those that were crucified. Think of what Christ went through for us to do that. That's what it means to take up our cross, to be willing to accept that persecution from friends, from family, from people that don't even know us, the TV shows. We get bashed every day in the news because of our faith in Christ. We have to be able to stand that and be proud of that. It is subjecting ourselves to the hostile, howling mob, the insult and the ridicule before the world for thinking, acting, and living differently to live as Jesus Christ lived. It is total surrender to Christ. To take up our cross daily involves prayer, Bible study, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, receiving strangers, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, visiting prisoners, witnessing in the light of the context of the situation, suffering hardships in order to do God's will, just as he did for us by submitting to the cross. Be willing to die for Jesus' sake. Think of Rachel Joy Scott. Rachel Joy Scott was one of the young ladies, high school junior, that was killed in Columbine by Dylan Klingold. Asked if she believed in Jesus Christ, she said yes, and he shot her. The Christians in Oregon that were just murdered. The Middle Eastern Christians that had been beheaded and had their throats slit by, by ISIS. Even going back to the apostles, all of which who died grisly deaths. And then there's the martyred Christians in China, Vietnam, Korea, and India, too numerous to mention. All were willing to die for Jesus' sake and held firm in their commitment to him, even when faced with certain death. We've been very fortunate here in the U.S. We haven't had that type of persecution, but we need to be ready for it because it's coming. The third thing we must do is follow Christ. Now, when we talk about following Christ, this denotes the pupil-master relationship. And remember our Greek definition for disciple, pupil-learner equals disciple. We do this following Christ by obeying God's will, by self-denial, by taking up his cross, to live a continuous, continuous, say this real fast, Randy, to live a continuously committed lifestyle to Christ. The response of the disciples to follow Jesus is not an act of faith in Jesus, but more significantly, it is an act of obedience. Jesus calls for his disciples to be submissively obedient. The fourth item is to lose his life. To lose one's life means to lose one's life to the will of God. This involves the three conditions that we've already mentioned before. Deny oneself, taking up the cross, suffering in obedience, and continually following Christ in the will of God. We must not be ashamed of Christ. The shame seems to imply a denial of one's identification with Christ in the face of pressure to live for and identify with the world. You know, Jesus wants us to know that anyone who identifies with him will be rewarded, while anyone who shrinks from him will be denied by him before his father. Again, we're fortunate that we haven't been challenged in this way in this condition here in the United States, not like the people I just mentioned earlier, but the way the world is going, we may very soon be faced with the decision to identify or reject Christ. We have to be prepared for this. Now, here's the one that really sticks with a lot of people, and they really wonder, does Jesus really want us to hate our family? If you could put those, those scriptures up, Solomon. Matthew 10, 37, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. But Luke really says it when he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, such a person cannot be my disciple. Jesus says the one who loves family more than him is not worthy of him. In Luke, he says that no one can be his disciple who does not hate his family. Now, let's not equate the term hate in the manner in which it is so customarily used today. Jesus was most likely using a Semitic figure of speech here as Luke's words are from the literal translation of the Aramic original. And the verb hate in this translation does not carry the full sense of the term that it carries that we're so accustomed to hearing it today. It means no more than love less. And Matthew has actually turned this into a very positive thing. Not that they must love the immediate family less than Jesus, 
They must love Jesus more. Loyalty to the master must override even the closest family tie. Jesus must be the object of our supreme love and devotion if one is to be a follower, a disciple. And the last thing is to forsake all, the last condition. Luke 14, 33, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. In this scripture, Jesus says that whoever does not forsake me cannot be my follower. This condition demands that a believer commit or surrender whatever possessions are necessary in order for him to follow God's will. This condition is in absolute terms. It's a hard concept for some people to grasp, especially new believers who suddenly feel that they, like the rich man, have to surrender all their possessions, their homes, their finances. Question is, do we literally have to give away everything we own to become Christians? No, we don't. But we do have to be willing to forsake all, meaning that we cling to nothing that takes precedence over Christ, which is why the term necessary is so critical in the first paragraph. The reason that's necessary is because if we have anything that we idolize, that we covet, that we lust after, that takes the place of Jesus, it has to go. That's why when coming to Christ is so difficult sometimes, because we have to let things go from the way we used to live our lives. We can't watch the same TV shows. We can't listen to the same music. We even have to let the people that we used to hang with go, and that sometimes includes family. Nothing can stand in the way and take the place of Jesus Christ in your heart. Nothing takes precedence over Christ. Well, I don't know about you, but that's quite a list, and I'm spent talking about it. Those are tough requirements to live up to, to employ, to do. Note that Christ, in using the words he used in laying out this scripture, used verbs, which are action words, meaning that we are to do something, deny, take up the cross, and follow him. Deny, take up, follow. It seems so simple, but it can be so hard to do. My question to you tonight is, are you all in? Are you hot or are you cold? Remember, there is no lukewarm. It's a very, what we call a very binary question. It's either yes or no. There's no gray area here. It's not like the tax code. There's no maybe. There's no gray area, no maybe. It either it is or it isn't. Either you are or you're not. You know, we have become so accustomed to the cafeteria approach to life. You know, I'll take a serving of this, I'll take a serving of that, and oh, let's not forget the dessert. But unfortunately, many believe they can take this cafeteria approach, this selective commitment approach to their walk with the Lord. And as we discovered tonight, you can't do that. There's no cherry picking with Jesus. Now, let's close back to circling back to our fan versus follower intro. Following Christ, as we have learned, is more than just saying yes to an invitation. It's more than just coming to church, singing with the praise and worship team, sitting through a great message, Pastor Pete's not mine, while these are good things to do, and we love to see people here praising and worshiping the Lord, following Christ is a lot more than that. As we have learned, it can be tough, very, very tough. And fans will bail on Jesus when it gets tough. When we learn after coming to Christ that we can't do the things that we used to do, we can't live our life the way we used to live. In other words, I want to have to get God to come in here and chisel all these things off of me, and that hurts. Fans will bail on Jesus when they find out that, you know what, there's more required to this. When Jesus asked them to sacrifice, to take up their cross, and each one of us has a different cross to take up, by the way. It's not the same cross for any of us in here. Our cross is as unique as our fingerprint. To die for ourselves, at this point, fans jump off the bandwagon. One thing I do know is that none of us want to be declared a fan on Judgment Day. And I know that we are not offered the guarantees that we always want, but Jesus does offer a guarantee. Jesus guarantees that if you put your trust in him, he will never fail you. He guarantees that if you stake your life on his message of truth, he will stake his life on your eternity in heaven. 
Jesus guarantees that if you put your trust and your hope in him, he'll guide you to eternity with the Father. We don't know the day that he'll come, but we know his name. And the scripture tells us, by his name alone, men are saved. We have a tradition at UNC, and I know this is the case at other schools as well, that after the horn has sounded ending the end of the game, the players and the coaches make their way over to where the students are sitting, or in the case of a road game where the UNC fans are sitting. And the pep band, pep band, pep band comes up, plays the alma mater, and we all sing it together. It's a really good feeling, and it's, it's just a really blessed event when that happens. But the sad thing about this is, is that by the time this happens at the end of the game, most of the stands have emptied. So there are only a few fans left. These are the followers that have, commi- that have stayed until the end to see the last play, the last second. Yes. And because as silly as it seems, it really means a lot to the players when that happens. You hate to look up there. You're out there still playing. It may be the only time that you get in the game and the stands are empty. It means a lot to the players when the fans stick around. Especially when they stick to the end, regardless of whether we've won or we've lost. I think Christ wants to know that if we're going wants to know if we're going to stick with him until the end, no matter what the circumstances are in our life, are we going to follow him to the end, to the last second? Or are we going to bail out early just to beat the traffic? You have to decide. Are you a fan or a follower of Jesus? Will you scream, rant, yell, stomp, and applaud with passionate fury when you're with him? Or will you just sit quietly by on your hands, embarrassed to make a spectacle of yourself? Let me put it to you this way to make one last point. Jesus follows you. He walks with you. He accompanies you. He comes alongside of you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He is your ever-present help in a time of trouble. He dries your tears when you're hurting, and he holds you tight, and he beams when you succeed and when you have breakthrough, when you have victory. It sounds to me like Jesus is more than a fan of ours. I'm just wondering, can't we be more than a fan of him? Thank you.